we'll edit this out, but I just want to make sure last name Ephraim. 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 Thank you. I'm glad I asked. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, friends. Welcome. I'm so excited to do this podcast about prolapse because it's been a long while and I don't expect my super fans like go back and listen to the podcast from episode one, but there's like over 200 episodes at this point. There is a very remote prolapse episode, but it's time to revisit. So I am here with my new friend, Dr. So Dr. Sonia Eif Oh, fuck. I fucked it up. Who am I here with? Who, who are you? Just kidding. I'm here with my friend, Dr. Sonia Ephraim. Ephraim. Do it for me. Ephraim. Think of fried food. Ephraim. I love it. <laughs> I'm here with my friend, Dr. Sonia Ephraim, who is a urogynecologist based in the Midwest out of Chicago, and she does a ton of prolapse, and I do a ton of prolapse, and we're so excited to talk about prolapse today. You did your ob residency, and then you went back and did a fellowship specifically in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, mm -hmm. and now yeah. that's what you do. Yep. No more catching babies. I no strictly... more catching babies. I would have done the same thing. Yep. Strictly if babies came between the hours of 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. It wouldn't be, be so all... bad, would it? I would be all about the babies. <laughs> the first it time is... I delivered the baby, I was like, the miracle of life. Like mm -hmm. by baby number four, I'm like, oh, they come at 2 a.m. frequently. <laughs> <laughs> the miracle of life likes really nighttime. Quickly. Yeah, they like to come really quickly, too. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, and, and there's such an unmet need for female pelvic health, female pelvic surgeons. Like, I always say this to to be funny, but it's like women are fifty percent of the population. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of people, and we do not have enough. You know, the untreated prolapse, the untreated incontinence, all of that is, uh, I think, part of it's just education, and then we don't have enough people to to help that out. How did you decide to go from to to do a fellowship in? female pelvic medicine and reconstruction after being, you know, catching all the babies for five years after residency? It was a tough decision. You know, I had, by that time I had a family and I was making a living and supporting my family, but I found that the population I was serving was aging and I saw a ton of pelvic floor disorders in the office and I had pretty good training in residency, but there were some big cases that I would have to refer out and I just got to a point where I didn't want to have to refer them out anymore. And I got such satisfaction from doing the small surgeries that I was doing and seeing the huge impact on quality of life that I was having for women. It was like outside of catching someone's baby and being there for that pivotal moment of life, when you restore someone's quality of life, it was, they were so grateful and it was phenomenal and the surgeries were challenging. So um, yeah, I just loved it. I love it. I, I love the same thing of like, you lift their pelvic floor back up, you change their life. Like mm -hmm. so many things get better. Um, let's define for everybody, what is pelvic organ prolapse? Pelvic organ prolapse. So that's when your pelvic organs, such as your rectum, your bladder, your uterus are displaced out of their normal position. You can, I try to explain it to my patients like a hernia because most people know what a herniation is. It's essentially a herniation in the vagina. So all of that connective tissue that was holding things nice and snug in place becomes weak and things start bulging out and you can feel that bulge usually protruding through the vagina. And that's yeah, when it becomes I, symptomatic. I love that because I really think it needs like vaginal prolapse needs a rebranding because mm -hmm. so many people come in with shame you know, shame that somehow they caused this or that it's a shameful thing. And I'm like, dude, when men get inguinal hernias, which is like the equivalent in men, right? This is a prolapse. Mm -hmm. Men have prolapse through their inguinal canal because of mm -hmm. a weakness. They, they don't go around saying how shamed they are by it. They're like, I'm a badass because I lifted this thing and I got a hernia, you know? And right. I'm like, dude, you're a badass because you had a freaking 10 pound baby or you're a badass because you know, you've know you lived long enough. And like, mm -hmm. we just really need a, a rebranding of prolapse, I think. Yeah, for sure. I definitely talk to my patients about that because they do, they come in thinking, oh God, did I do something wrong? And I'm like, you know what? It's not your fault. All you did was live a good life, you know, and you had babies, you know, we're not gonna tell you not to do that. Of course, there are some modifiable risk factors that we want to talk about, but ultimately, you know, reproducing is one of the biggest risk factors, right? And we're not going to tell people to stop having children. So yeah, it just happens from living a full life. Totally. Um, 
you know, I think I always joke around with patients. I'm like, blame the kid with the biggest head. And like, they tend to know who that is. They're like, oh, that yeah. was Ryan. Yeah. And like, yep. I, I was pregnant with my first child. My husband was in front of me and I saw the back of his head. I was like six months pregnant. I looked at the back of his head and I was like, oh, shit, that's coming through there. Yeah. I also have a husband with quite a large head. He fits it nicely because of his tall stature. Uh, but my children um, definitely inherited that. And I got blessed. God knew I couldn't handle it. And so I never <laughs> progressed past the zero station, never passed them vaginally. So uh, vaginal bypass surgery is what I had. <laughs> <laughs> Two Dude, I'm stealing that. That is funny. <laughs> yeah, well, I put the 10 pound through the vagina. Oh. So I'm basically like, you know, all my friends are like, who's still going to be doing this when I need the help? Um, right. But I mean, I think it's super important to normalize. This is incredibly common. Hysterectomy, I think, was the was or is the most common surgery that a woman has in America Ooh. to be replaced, if not now, in the future by prolapse surgery because because people are living longer and we're taking yeah. out uteruses less. Do you yes. have you seen that same that same sort of data? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think uh, so many of my patients would come in and have already had a hysterectomy, but now we know out of all the, what, 300 to 400,000 hysterectomies that are done every year, it is a lot of them are unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And so we're finding other ways to treat some of these benign gynecologic position, uh, symptoms and concerns so that we don't have to do hysterectomies. And even with prolapse, right, there's a lot of times that we don't have to do a hysterectomy. Yeah. Yeah. And just to tie back in, you know, the risk of vaginal delivery for prolapse is higher than the risk of C-section because there is something about traveling through the pelvic floor with your mm -hmm. husband's big headed sized child. Um, <laughs> but it's not it's not enough to say that the risks of C-section, because people are like, why don't we just do C-sections for everybody? And it's like, dude, there's right. risks to surgical procedures. It's Nobody's so recommending we C-section the whole nation so we don't get prolapse. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just want to, you know, clear that up for people to be like, there's still a risk of prolapse, even in people who've never had a child c-section or not but oh, we absolutely. don't recommend surgical procedures to prevent future prolapse because you're still carrying that growing fetus and that large baby for you know nine months right so that's still um similar to how obesity is a risk factor you're still carrying that baby which is putting all that pressure on your pelvic floor um so definitely a risk but passing it through the vaginal canal that exponentially <laughs> takes it up and a couple of notches yeah. in scientific terms i mean the other the other non-modifiable risks would be age right mm -hmm. god bless we keep living we keep getting older um yes. the the pelvis that your parents gave you the connective tissue that your parents gave you i, I think hormone status is something that we don't have a lot of research on other right. non-modifiable risks i think we should talk about modifiable that's, risks yeah don't pretty, get constipated no constipation is the bane of my existence the number of women it's a standard question are you constipated do you strain the number of women who answer yes and then i say what are you doing about that preventive oh nothing i said so you just ride that out just wait and see if it gets better you're not taking right? the fear or... of hemorrhoids doesn't keep you up at night nobody feels good when they're constipated how are you mm -hmm. just walking around like that all day so we have a yeah. whole constipation handout that I hand out like candy, like, please read this. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that you hand out like fiber gummies. Yes. Um, I love fi the fiber gummies. I want your cheat sheets. I love the fiber gummies. I love Benefiber. Just throw mm -hmm. some Benefiber in your protein shake. Yep. Um, of course, lots of water. And then like to actually get the recommended fiber for women is 25 grams a day, which I, mm -hmm. I say it's like drinking water. You can't accidentally do that. Yeah. That's like, really very being intentional. Yeah, it's very, it's very actually hard to get that much fiber unless you plan it out. Yeah, with the American diet, nearly impossible. And, you know, I think for women, I've seen a lot of trend towards women doing the intermittent fasting, especially around menopause, because they're trying to control their weight. And if they're eating twice a day, God, that's even less opportunity to get that fiber in, right? Um, so water, fiber, stool, I tell my patients, stool softeners every day is not going to hurt you. And then um, throw some magnesium in there. That's going to help with your motility. Yeah, we have a whole cocktail. So that's what you should be doing on a daily basis. And then maybe if you travel or something, and anybody gets yeah. constipated when they travel, yep. then throw in some Miralax. But 
to just sit and do nothing, not such a good idea. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and so many people, here's a, a podcast about prolapse and we're like, having a nice poop is just lovely. It becomes more but important the older you it get. It is. Yeah, the totally. Little things. I mean, I, I mean, people, in, the older you get, there is some sort of correlation to your age and your interest in talking to your doctor about your poop. Like Absolutely. it definitely goes up with age. And, you know, I get to the grand privilege of like being a urologist where I'm like, we talk about your poop, visits over. And then people <laughs> keep talking about their poop. Like it's very interesting to people, their own poop. Yeah. But I'm like, if you tell, if you keep talking about your poop, the visit is done. Like I, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't, I hate it. I have, <laughs> I, I have amazing physical therapists who work a lot on the poop. So I'm like, go to the physical therapists. That's a good, that's good. Who are too. amazing. Um, <laughs> okay. So other modifiable risk factors, smoking. Smoking. I was just going to say that. Absolutely. Chronic smoking, cough. Obesity. Yeah. Obesity. You got allergies and you're coughing all the time. Please don't just cough. Do something to treat it. Yeah. Obesity for sure. Well, I know we're probably missing like a big obvious one that later on will be like, oh, right. Constipation's big. Yes. Anything where chronic heavy lifting, if you're like a bodybuilder or something, you know, women who are really, really into chronic heavy lifting, doing a mm -hmm. lot of squats and lunges with heavy weight. Yep. That can, that can do it. And, you mm -hmm. know, we were talking before we hit record on the role of hormones because prolapse is more common postmenopausal. Mm -hmm. And even though you had your baby 20 years ago, 25 years ago, right? The prolapse is now because you're postmenopausal. And the role of estrogen and collagen and estrogen and just how much we lose our muscle mass every year postmenopause with hormone decrease. But I have not seen any papers showing a a preventative effect of either systemic or local estrogen, testosterone, all the hormones on preventing pelvic organ prolapse. I th I have to think there's a correlation because why is it going up in menopause? But I mm -hmm. cannot show anybody those studies. Your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, I have the same the same thoughts. I have not seen any data on it, but logically it makes sense. We know when we lose the estrogen and we go through menopause that our muscles atrophy, they get weaker and thinner. Um, and so the same thing is happening in your pelvic floor. You can't see it, but it's happening. Um, we can tell when we're doing exams and checking that pelvic floor muscle strength. Uh, you see it when they are having worsening symptoms or, or um, defecation dysfunction. Cause, um, so it makes sense. It's logical. And yeah. hopefully yeah. it would be that if we replace those hormones, either locally or systemically, that it would improve that. Yeah. I mean, I've, I'm putting the cart before the horse, but post-prolapse, just in case we forget to talk about it, post-prolapse mm -hmm. kind of protocol to be like, we, you've got a great repair. How do we help you keep your repair? I mm -hmm. do pelvic floor physical therapy for rehab and I do vaginal estrogen because I'm like, mm -hmm. we know that it helps with collagen and mm -hmm. it helps keep the mucosa of the vagina nice and thick, but I can't give you a study to show, mm -hmm. to prove that, but just things I think about in keeping your repair once you get a nice repair. Thoughts, Absolutely. thoughts on that? Absolutely. I hand out vaginal estrogen like candy too. You know, to me, it has so many benefits and so few risks, hardly any that I can think of, that it is 100% worth being on it. And we know that it's going to, like you said, make that tissue stronger. And our support comes not just from our connective tissue, but from our muscles as well. We know the pelvic floor has estrogen receptors everywhere. So I'm going to help with your bladder health. I'm going to help with the vagina. I'm going to help with the microbiome. I'm going to help with everything just by putting someone on vaginal estrogen. Pelvic floor physical therapy, phenomenal. Again, how are we going to keep those muscles strong? How are we going to make sure that you know how to void properly and you're relaxing those muscles, retrain them because surgery is a stress, right? It's a yeah. stress. And oftentimes things get thrown off when we have a little bit of pain post-op, it can throw off how we're voiding and how we're having bowel movements. So I think PT is very important. Yeah, I always tell my spiel post post prolapse surgery is I fixed your bulge, but I didn't make you stronger. So the right. way that you lift, like if your core is weak and you're lifting and pushing out through, you know, the bottom of your pelvic bowl, all those things of like, you need to get stronger and, and kind of learn how to lift, learn how to toilet to help prevent recurrent prolapse. Mm -hmm. 
Um, sure. Recurrent prolapse after surgery, nationwide, the studies say about 20% or one in five will have a recurrent mm -hmm. prolapse. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's about right. And it's, you know, the thing is, it's not always in the same compartment, right? It can be a prolapse right. of a totally different compartment, but yeah. um, you will see those patients come back uh, with some kind of a bulge symptom later on. Yeah, or you'll fix the cystocele and they'll be like, the bulge is back and I got a big rectocele because they're still exactly. constipated, but they just Something didn't fix different. that. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Dude, one of my, this might be a urologist specific pet peeve because I think the bladder is the most perfect organ in the universe. But people come in and it, I finally have gotten feisty about this, but people are like, my bladder's prolapsing, my bladder's prolapsing. Mm -hmm. And it bothers me for two reasons. <clears throat> Number one, the bladder is not trying to leave your body. Like it is not the organ of fault being like, I got to get out of here. Let's go down. <laughs> right. So like the bladder is literally not the cause of that anterior vaginal wall prolapse. And the second reason that it it really upsets me that people call this bladder prolapse is because mm -hmm. that just means we aren't comfortable saying vagina. Right. And, and right. so many people are like, my doctor said I had bladder prolapse. And I'm like, eh, well, your bladder is descending in your pelvis. Yes, but it's mm -hmm. not its fault. And that's your vagina wall that you're feeling. And doctors just don't like saying vagina and either do patients. So there's exactly. my, my, it's not bladder prolapse soapbox 101. Mm -hmm. I have the same conversation. Yes. I explain it to oh, my Like it's patient. not just me. Fantastic. Thank you for no, making me feel no. normal. I just had this conversation today with a patient. I was like, you know, it's not your bladder. Think of your vagina like a shelf and your bladder is a book on the shelf. It's not the book's fault. The shelf is weak and fell down. So it's the shelf's fault. That's your vagina. So yeah, I try to take faults away from the bladder as well. Me too. I'm like, it's just a kid in the house, right? It's not mm -hmm. the kid's fault that the house is malfunctioning. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, the kid might be unhappy that its home life is not as good as it used to be. And, and, yeah. you know, and I, say, I tell people that I'm like, the bladder doesn't love living in the basement. You're going to mm -hmm. see a lot more overactive. This is like symptoms of prolapse, right? You're, uh, mm -hmm. you're going to see a lot more overactive bladder frequency, getting up at night to pee, feeling like your bladder isn't empty all the way because it's kind of kinked off a little bit. So like bladder does not like living in the basement. Bladder loves living in the penthouse and we're going to get it back mm -hmm. there. Oh, that's awesome. I like it. <laughs> you, can, you can steal it. It's not trademark. I use that one. Yeah. You can steal it. Bladder loves the penthouse. But I think that's, you know, in, in talking about prolapse treatments, whether it's physical therapy for mild prolapse or pessaries for non-surgical options or surgery, pe people really are interested and they're like, will my bladder get better? Mm -hmm. Right. And I really am careful in sussing out the difference between prolapse and bulge and bladder right. issues. So oftentimes I tell people that the the overactive bladder symptoms, the incomplete emptying is likely to improve. But mm -hmm. when I do surgery, it's to fix the prolapse. Right. right. We can have overactive bladder symptoms and leaky bladders with no prolapse. So really right. some of my education for people is like bladder leakage and behavior is different than like an unsupported vaginal wall or the prolapse symptoms. Yes. What I'm doing is structural. I'm fixing the structure, putting things back where they belong. And sometimes that overactive bladder right after surgery can get a little bit worse before it gets better. So it's I feel like setting appropriate expectations is so important on how patients feel afterwards, whether they think you're a great doctor or you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Like, oh, my God, what I get into is like so I, I set the bar low knowing that I'll overachieve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's my trick. That's why my patients love me so yep. well. Because I'm like, eh, you might get a little better, and then they're like, I feel great. I'm like, I knew you would. So set that bar nice and low, so they have appropriate expectations. Yeah. They so talk about what are common symptoms of prolapse when people come in to see you. Like for people, it's like, how do I know if I have a prolapse? And to mm -hmm. me, I'm like. Laxity of the vaginal wall, incredibly common. Number one, as we age. Number two, as we have babies. It's mm -hmm. like 30 or 40 percent of women will have a grade one to two cystocele after a vaginal delivery. So very, mm -hmm. very common, but not symptomatic and doesn't need to be fixed. Right. So just to normalize laxity as we age is normal and common and usually not bothersome. Mm -hmm. But then what are people talking about when you start thinking about like a pessary, non-surgery and surgery options for prolapse? Right. So, you know, if it gets to the, I always tell my patients, that if it gets to the point where it's affecting your quality of life, where that bulge is now uncomfortable, be it um, you don't 
exercise like you used to, or you're afraid of being on your feet all day, you have to stop and rest and put your legs up, or if it's affecting your intimate life, um, where you eat. a lot of women get body image issues over this, right? They don't mm -hmm. feel like themselves. They don't feel as sexual um, because of the changes in their body. Once it's causing, it's not usually painful, but once right. it's causing any discomfort or whether you that bulge sensation is rubbing on your undergarments, causing bleeding, irritation, dryness, it's affecting your quality of life, then it's time for us to do something about it, be that non-surgical or surgical. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm very careful with pain because you can have pain in your pelvis for many, many reasons. And oftentimes it's not the bulge's fault. There's either mm -hmm. pelvic floor dysfunction, hip issues, you know, nerve stuff going on that's not because of the bulge. And that's a very important thing to talk to people about because they'll get their bulge fixed and not have the pain get any better. Certainly right. you'd see this, you know, with people who are like, I need my uterus out for my pain. They get a hysterectomy. They still have pain. Exactly. Because it wasn't the uterus's fault. And that's um, the thing about uh, setting the appropriate expectations, right? And sometimes with those patients with pain, I will strongly encourage them to try a pessary first. Like if it's the bulge and we wear a pessary for a little while, that pain should get better. If it doesn't get better, it's not the bulge. We got to find another reason. Yeah, I love that. It's like a risk-free trial of what surgery mm -hmm. might get you is absolutely mm -hmm. brilliant. So let's talk about a pessary for a second. What is it? What, you know, why might somebody use one? They've been around since like documentable history, like pomegranates, yes. pomegranates and fruit back, you know, 2000 yes. years ago were the pessaries because we didn't have silicone. Exactly. <laughs> we didn't exactly. have, uh, you know, computer printing. Yeah, there's there was just nice, an article uh, about like personal pessary using 3D printing. Did you see that? I did not. Yeah, the future of that pessaries is here. A little bit. Right? Like you, I don't know, you put your pelvis in an MRI and then they 3D print you a pessary or something. Wow. I know. That's not going to be $60. No, no, <laughs> not easily accessible for That's anyone. not going to be covered by Medicare, my friends. No. And, um, okay, uh, so what's a what's a pessary? So pessaries are usually made out of silicone. They're little devices. They come in different shapes and sizes. And it's a non-surgical way to reduce your prolapse. You put it in the vagina. A lot of women, when I describe it to them, they're like, oh, like a diaphragm. Kind of. It's just something you stick in the vagina and it pushes everything up. It doesn't fix anything, but it reduces the prolapse and resolves symptoms of the bulge, the pelvic pressure. The one caveat I always tell people is it may reduce your prolapse. You may end up with some incontinence that we didn't know about because as the prolapse pulls everything down and it kinks the urethra, the tube we pee out of, oftentimes that urethra, that kink is protecting women from incontinence, right? Um, and so when we push everything up, yeah, the bulge is gone, but are you going to be okay with a little bit of leakage? Risk-free yeah. trial. We can take it out if you hate it, but it's a nice caveat just to let them know that that could happen. And there's so many different sizes and shapes that are used for different varying degrees of prolapse. Um, so there's there's lots of good options for that. Yeah, you bring up uh, multiple good points there. As you can go on Amazon and buy a pessary, but it's not fitted towards for you. And mm -hmm. so that's why I always say, you know, get it fitted by somebody who knows what they're doing because just getting one off, it's like buying a leg brace, you know, an ankle support of like, it might not fit. How do you know you're a small, right? You don't right. <laughs> unless you get fitted. Um, so that might be my, my first advice that what we call de novo stress incontinence. So mm -hmm. when you fix your prolapse, now you leak more. That doesn't mean that the pessary or the surgery caused leakage. It means you always would have leaked had you not had prolapse that kind of masked it. Right. Um, and so that's always, those are very disappointed patients if you don't counsel on de novo stress incontinence after pessary or surgery. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you would have always had that had you not had your prolapse to begin with. But now we have to address that. And they thought for a while that we should just throw slings in everybody when we fixed their prolapse to help prevent that, that risk from happening. But they said, you know, risks of mesh in everybody is not worth it. Mm -hmm. Just counsel on de novo stress incontinence and deal with it if it happens afterwards. Yeah. Any, any comments on that? I think um, just one other thing about the pessaries and, you know, buying them on Amazon or doing your own thing is I have seen far too many complications of pessaries in my career. It is 
pretty low risk when managed appropriately. But if it goes unmanaged, I've had women who forgot they were in there and had them in there for years. And I take them out and there's fistulas, you know, they come in because they're leaking urine or stool because they've got an abnormal hole between the bladder and the vagina or between the rectum and the vagina. I had a partner that one migrated all the way through the posterior cul-de-sac and was sitting in the pelvis. She had to have a laparoscopic surgery to have it removed. Um, and so we see people get ulcers and granulation where it's, you know, pressing on that vaginal tissue too hard. And as we get older, that tissue is weak, right? So it causes um, like ulcerations uh, on the tissue and they have bleeding. So it is very low risk when managed appropriately, but I put people on pessary contracts in my office. Interesting. Like, you're not going to come back and let me check this thing. I'm taking it out and not giving it back to you because yeah. I can't take the risk that you're going to disappear into the world and come back with a fistula. I Yeah seen it happen <laughs> yeah it's devastating i've heard of it happening like my mom's mm -hmm. friend or something but i have knock on freaking wood i have had to take a patient to the operating room to remove one because she left it in for years and then you know got narrowing of the the yes. entrance of the vagina it would just it would not come out awake um, but that's as bad as i've seen it we're not saying this to deter people from non-surgical options we're just saying oh, no. everything everything comes with a risk not treating yes. your prolapse has risks Right. right. I just so, encourage, like you said, make sure you get it fitted with a professional and make sure you understand that you need to take it out and wash it every now and then. Maybe yeah. you need to leave it out overnight to give your vagina a break every now and then, you know, just manage it properly. And then can you, am I still there? Can you hear me? Yep. I got you. Okay. And then also, you know, with the incontinence too, you know, I counsel my patients that this could happen. We try to do some testing to see what would happen if they were wearing a pessary and they were leaking, then I know, okay, we should probably do some sort of support of your urethra um, yep. and just give them that option as to what they want to do. I love it. Yeah. Another, another, you know, metaphor I use for pessaries is like, listen, I've got a weak knee and I like to wear a brace when I ski. I'm not at the point of cert needing surgery for my knee yet, but I just need a little more support. And mm -hmm. I think that sort of metaphor helps people understand like, yeah, I'm not ready for surgery or I don't want the risks of surgery, but I need a little more support. I'm going to choose a pessary. And so I have some people, they just use it with exercise, right? Yes. Or, or they, they'll take it out. I, they're like, can I have sex with it? I'm like, I think it's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. Uh, I think a, I think a lot of people take their pessaries out to have sex. But just to clarify for people, you can be sexually active with prolapse. You aren't going to hurt it. You're not going to make it worse by having you know intimacy with prolapse. I think so many people stop being sexually active with prolapse. And and if you're comfortable, you, there's really no reason that you need to be, from a medical standpoint, not be sexually mm -hmm. active with prolapse. Anything you want to mm -hmm. add about sexual activity and prolapse? You know, only that the same as you said, I think that women need to be reassured that they can, uh, their partners need to be reassured that they're not going to hurt each other. You know, you can, and it's actually pushing it back in, which might be a good thing. So intimacy is perfectly fine. However, like I mentioned before, a lot of women do have some body image issues, which prevents them, um, in addition to the, just the fear that they're going to hurt something. So reassuring them is very important. And even after they have a repair, if they choose to do that, um, helping them to get back on the horse, so to speak, is mm -hmm. um, very important. I have a sexual wellness coach that I collaborate with sometimes who my patients, if they are having some trouble just kind of getting over that fear, I have them do sessions with her just to kind of get their sexuality back. Amazing. I love that. Mm -hmm. That's that's so comprehensive of you. Thank, mm -hmm. thank you for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Physical pelvic floor physical therapist. We can't we can't have a prolapse talk without talking about pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, I think for mild cases, or if it's not that bothersome, and I want to know what I can do so it doesn't get worse. I think pelvic floor physical therapy is amazing. Um, if people have access to that, I think it's so much more than Kegels, right? It's your core strength, your lower back strength. How are you lifting? How are you pooping? Like really mm -hmm. a comprehensive pelvic floor analysis can go a long way um, mm -hmm. with prolapse. Certainly if it's stage four, which I describe stage four as like it's in between your thighs, right? It, yeah. We can't anti-gravity all of that with Kegels. So I think right. there is a point where physical therapy is not going to be able to to reduce it but especially for the rectocele the 25 grams of fiber a day and pelvic floor pt can really make a lot of 
backside of the vagina, what we call rectocele's, uh, asymptomatic. So that's mm-hmm. quite nice. Rectocele's tend to be trickier with pessaries as well. Um, yeah. So I think pel- pelvic floor physical therapy, treating constipation can be good. Anything else you want to add on, on non-surgical options or pelvic floor? No, I think pelvic floor physical therapy is great. Patients who are trying to kick the can down the road, you know, they don't want to have their surgery yet. Um, definitely with the rectocele's because pessaries tend to push those, or rectocele's tend to push pessaries out. <laughs> they don't mm-hmm. stay put so well. Um, and again, just like lifelong strengthening and keeping your pelvic floor healthy, you know, it's you, you can never go wrong with having uh, pelvic floor physical therapy on its own or in addition to the rest of your treatment plan. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, let's get into surgery because that's what you and I do. Mm-hmm. If yep. you are symptomatic, maybe the pessary didn't work. Maybe you don't want to freaking... I, I ask women, especially like the younger women, I'm like, do you want this for the next 40 years? Right? Because mm-hmm. they don't really think like if you choose pessary, like that's managing a pessary for 40 years versus, mm-hmm. you know, getting it fixed and which is quite safe outpatient surgery. Um, Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the different surgery options. So, you know, my conversation with patients goes, you know, everywhere from the most conservative to the most invasive. And honestly, the surgical options depends on a lot of things. What is their health status? You know, how um, physically active are they? How sexually active are they? Uh, do they have a partner? Is intimacy important anymore? So you can go anywhere from a reconstructive surgery to put everything back where it belongs, where you have a nice, normal, functional vagina at the end. And if vaginal penetration is important, then you want to do that. Or the other um, branch of the tree is obliterative surgeries, right? Where we essentially close the vagina. Um, very wonderful surgery in that it's extremely low risk. It's extremely effective, but only good for women who know that vaginal penetration is not important to them anymore. Um, so you have to, that's kind of the first conversation I have depending on their age and whatnot is okay, are we trying to give you a a functional vagina back or are you done with it and just want to never have to deal with this prolapse ever again? Mm -hmm. Um, And then when we go into the, they choose reconstruction, then we have some nice minimally invasive options. um, And then we have more invasive, uh, the minimally invasive things like a vaginal extraperitoneal copalpexy, a hysteropexy, where we're putting the uterus back where it belongs if you have a uterus or a sacral copalpexy where we're using um, a mesh to strengthen the procedure. So are we doing mesh-based procedures? There's so many options. There's so many but options. I most of my patients, so many options. We can do make anything to fit what your goals are. Uh, even recovery, like, oh, I'm young. I have this prolapse that's bothering me, but I have this job that I can't afford to be off of work for six to eight weeks. So, okay, well, let's find a surgery that's going to work for that and give you a shorter recovery. And there's some wonderful um, new hysteropexy procedures like the um, end place procedure that we're doing that gets you much quicker recovery, less downtime, less blood loss, less pain, so that you can get back to normal everyday life. Mm -hmm. I love it. You know, I think, Mm -hmm. you know, what I want people to know is there's so many different ways to skin the cat proverbially, but there's probably one that's best for you, but really to be talking to a surgeon who does the surgeries and can really tailor that. You know, is it your first prolapse repair? Is it your second prolapse repair? You know, I'm going to think about mm-hmm. people differently that way. Is your apex or top of your vagina well supported? Or is that cervix really the first thing I see when I'm doing a, a, a physical exam? Is your mm-hmm. uterus big? Is your uterus atrophic? Do you have a uterus? Right. So there's really so many different things that go in. This is why it took us so long to train to be able to do our jobs. Right. It's really individualizing things by and large. I, you know, most if it's not if it's not your first if it's not your a repeat prolapse repair. So if it's your first one, people tend and I'm overgeneralizing. They tend to want to stay out of the abdomen. They tend to not be interested in big pieces of mesh. Most right. women have heard about the risks of what it was vaginal mesh. Um, mm-hmm. And so we, even a sacral copal, or even a robot sacral copalpexy with mesh, they tend to shy away from any sort of mesh. Mm-hmm. Um, so really the vaginal approaches are going to, you know, that risk of, of not having mesh. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And, you know, one other thing about the surgery and finding a provider, 
who a surgeon who can do this, like you touched on, so important to make sure you go to someone that can do all of the procedures or at least is willing if they can't do it at least willing to refer you out if they know that you would be better off with something that they don't do um i find often women come and maybe it is their second but they had one surgery by someone who said oh this is the only thing that i can do for you you know Mm -hmm. and to me that's a disservice to women i like to be able to educate them on absolutely everything and then heaven forbid i can't do it i'll send you to someone who can yeah, that's a, that's how I am too. I mean, I I've stopped doing robot mesh, you know, sacral copal pexies, but I have friends who do them, and they're high volume mm-hmm. surgeons. And, and my opinion is, if you're gonna get mesh in the abdomen, you know, do go to somebody who's doing a lot of it. So right. I. I chose to say, you know, I'm super good at the vaginal based repairs, but mm-hmm. if you're getting into, I've had mesh before, or I've, you know, failed the vaginal approach, then I know that I'm going to want to refer you on to get to mm-hmm. that high volume place who does those complex failure mesh based repairs. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But yeah, I love vaginal surgery. I think it's a dying art. It's like, it's my happy place. That's I sad. Love... You think it's a dying, you think most people are getting trained robot mesh based as, as first I option? They, I think they are. I think you so and I are of the same people, generation. <laughs> yeah. So many people are jumping on that robot and the way it has been branded and marketed to the public, it's almost like patients hear robot and they think it's better. I think it's better. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. no, it's just a, another instrument. It's like my scalpel. It's like mm-hmm. anything that I use. It's depends on who's using it, first of all. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not actually doing the surgery. <laughs> you know right, I mean? right, right. We're, we're not putting quarters into the machine to have it do it for us so we can drink coffee on the side. Like that would be yeah, sweet, but it's never going to happen. There. There's a person. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. Um, through the abdomen, right? Mm-hmm. Higher risk of bowel complications. And we're putting mesh yes. in there with robots. Um, by and large. So there is an increased risk when you add mesh, go through the abdomen versus the vaginal. I I mean, I like vaginal. It's outpatient surgery. Yes. And go, the, you have to go home. We could do this in a surgery center. Go home much shorter, right? Some of those robotic cases, three, four, five hours, depending who's doing it. And you're in this steep Trendelenburg with all that gas. It causes complications afterwards. Where a vaginal surgery, man, I can be in and out 45 minutes to an hour, depending on like if I'm doing a hysteropexy and a sling and, a, you know, making the introitus appropriate GH size. Like there's, it's so much quicker and more, there's more finesse, I think. I love <laughs> but I'm it. biased. I like it. Yeah, totally. Tell me, could because you are you are a gynecologist, so you can take out uteruses. That's I'm a urologist, so I I'll always involve my gynecologist to do a combo mm-hmm. surgery if we're going to. How mm-hmm. do you counsel a woman or think about uterine sparing versus a hysterectomy with a prolapse repair? Can you talk us through your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think most of the research that I've seen shows that um, most often taking the uterus out does not improve your long-term outcomes. So um, you're having a longer surgery, more risk of blood loss and complications to remove the uterus. Now, if the uterus is large and bulky or the cervix is very large, I will counsel the patient that a hysterectomy at the time of prolapse repair is probably appropriate. But I have found that even vaginal hysterectomies, it's not like I used to do. You know, I used to do a lot of them. And now these new surgical techniques, you don't really have to take a lot of people's uterus out. So I just counsel them, you know, you got a really small atrophic postmenopausal uterus that baby can stay right where it is, you know, and go up and be beautifully supported with a hysteropexy. So hysteropexy, just to break it down for people, uterus being pexed or basically put back in to the pelvis. Yes, absolutely. Definition of hysteropexy. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Versus hysterectomy is removing the uterus. Right. So uterus, uterine sparing versus a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, you know, also, I think, you know, female, just because of the nature of this podcast, female sexual health in pelvic surgery has, by and large, I think, been underserved or ignored, um, mm-hmm. you know, in, in some people believing that the cervix does not play a role in sexual function. The, the studies don't support that. It doesn't, the cervix isn't a sexual organ for everybody. 
but for mm-hmm. some people it is. And mm-hmm. it, another reason to think like, maybe I want to preserve the cervix in any sort of prolapse procedure might be sexual function for people. But if you don't bring that up to your surgeon, they're not going to know that that's an important thing for you. Right. They won't think about it. And, you know, my opinion too is sometimes if it's not bothering you, why am I bothering it? You know, if that uterus isn't hurting you or doing anything, I'm going to leave her right where she is. Um, And then also with the sexual wellness, not every surgeon is as conscientious about uh, not taking vaginal length when they take the uterus out. So sparing vaginal length for a woman, because that we know definitely affects uh, sexuality and our ability to uh, accommodate penetration, right? So Mm -hmm. you don't want to have a short vagina, um, or especially if I have patients when I do my measurements before surgery, and they already are right at the cusp, maybe their vaginal length is only seven or six and a half. I do counsel them, hey, you know, when we're talking about your surgical plan, let's talk about how much vaginal length you might lose. Even if I'm as good as possible about leaving it, you're scarring, the tissue contracts, you might have a shorter vagina afterwards. Do you have a partner? Is he endowed? Like, what are we dealing with here? So it's definitely a conversation that we have to have. Yeah. I mean, I think it just, again, reiterates like everybody is individualized thinking that there's a one size fits all for all pelvises. And and I see that all the time, right? Because why do women tend to come to the doctor? It's because their sister had X, Y, and Z or their friend had X, Mm -hmm. Y, and Z. I see it all the time. People are like, can I get Botox for my bladder? My friend had it. I'm like, you do not even have that problem. (laughs) Like, (laughs) Just because your friend had it does not mean you should get it too, right? Everybody's so individualized. When you do, so I, you know, when I do vaginal surgeries, I do what they call a sacrospinous ligament fixation to re-lengthen the top and the apex or what they call level one support back mm-hmm. into the pelvis. How do, how are you working with the in-place device with your hysteropexies? Is it the same sort of concept or is it a little bit different? Please share with me what, yeah. what's happening. Yeah, it's absolutely, um, it's the same concept. You are giving that level one support at the level of the sacrospinous ligament. It's a bilateral procedure. I know back in the day they used to do these unilaterally. Um, I don't know, maybe something about that bothers me having a lopsided vagina, but yeah. So it's, you know, the attachment points are the same. And the one benefit of it is, you know, I do the vaginal extraperitoneal copalpexy all the time. With the end place, I don't have to do that extensive dissection which is wonderful, especially if you have a patient who's maybe had uh, some surgery before or she's got a really, really tight introitus. Um, It's very nice to be able to put those points of attachment directly through the vaginal epithelium. So you're really just putting a dart right in the same position on the sacrospinous ligament right through um, without having to do an extensive dissection. Decreases your blood loss, makes the surgery faster, less incisions to heal, so less pain. Um, it's it's really a very slick procedure. Can you do this in place technique if you don't have a uterus? So I do it on anyone who has a cervix because the point of attachment cervix. after, okay. yep, if you still have um, your attachment at the sacrospinous ligament and then you're going to bring that suture up and anchor it into the cervix. So if they've had a supracervical hysterectomy, uh, then I will still do the procedure. Oop. Are you there? I'm there you here. Are. Okay. The, so the... It's the end place is for if you have a uterus or cervix, if you've previously had a cervix bearing hysterectomy. Correct. Okay. That makes sense. I love it. Mm -hmm. And I think this, these are really important conversations because so many women, they fear surgery because they think the surgery is going to be like really risky, really dangerous. How many days am I going to be in the hospital? What's my downtime going to be? And, And really realizing that the modern prolapse repair is usually outpatient. Blood loss is very minimal. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there's always risks of pain, infection, and damage to surrounding structures in any surgery that we do, whether it's your toe or your ear or your pelvis. There's always risks. But really, I think what women's view of what these surgery is is much bigger than really the the minimally invasive techniques that we have now. Mm -hmm, For sure. Um, Like I said, I get with the the end place. I can be in and out of the operating room. And if that's the only thing that I'm doing, it's a 30 minute procedure and they go home the same day. I've had one failure and it was a woman who felt 
so good that she did not follow my post op and the anchor. Mm -hmm. um, we let her heal and recover. And then I repeated the same procedure again. Okay. So that's the nice thing too, is that you can repeat it. And mm -hmm. the next time she's like, I know I did it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm glad you feel good, but can we slow right? down just a little bit? <laughs> I know. Well, that, I mean, I see that so much, right? It's like the, these procedures are so minimally invasive. Pain, pain is our body's way of saying not yet, right? Yes. And, they, and they don't have pain. And so they're like, I can probably, I could probably do this. Yeah, yeah. What sort of, what sort of vaginal rest for the end place do you have? What's your standard to say, hey, you can resume physical activity after our post-op exam at what week? You know, I do a standard post-op exam at two weeks. Um, I tell them they can get back to normal everyday activity, um, barring like super heavy lifting or penetration um, at that two week appointment. I'm super conservative about my restrictions. I know the research shows they can probably get back to normal activity in three to four days, but I'm still very conservative. Um, and I make them wait six weeks to have intimacy, uh, mm -hmm. just just to be cautious. I want to make want sure it to that, go well, you know, yeah, I want it to go well. I want I want them to be <laughs> happy. And I'm like, you, you can wait. I promise you it'll still be there in six weeks. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. That's super sweet. I love it. Um, anything else that we missed or didn't talk about? I think we, we covered, I, we didn't say the word for obliterative. So if we close your vagina top to bottom, we close it. That's called copoclysis. And even my mm -hmm. staff can't say that word after working with me for years. It's a tricky word, but basically closure of the vagina is copoclysis. Mm -hmm. And then there's vaginal based repairs, which we've just been talking about, uterine sparing or hysterectomy. And then there's the abdominal with mesh, which is the robot sacral copopexy, which again, big word, but basically lifting up from inside the abdomen instead of pushing up from the vagina is the other approach. Did we miss any big things as far as surgery goes? I don't think so. Those are the branches of the tree. We did know. good. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, if we have significant stress incontinence, which is separate mm -hmm. from prolapse, you can add a sling on at the same time mm -hmm. um, if you're already. So there, that would be, the, I think, the other nuance to getting prolapse surgery is do you need a sling for stress incontinence? I think we touched on to um, maybe that it's different compartments of the vagina. You have yeah. the posterior, the anterior, the apex. Any one of those compartments could prolapse. And so your surgery is going to be based on which compartment of the vagina is actually prolapsed. We don't do preventive or prophylactic repairs. So that if they're, I'm in there doing a rectocele and you're like, well, can you just do the anterior wall too? Mm, no, it doesn't no. work like if that. If it's not there to fix, you can't fix it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I see that a lot. It's interesting you know, just to get a little more nuanced. Like, I think cystoceles are the number one bothersome prolapse, at least in my practice. And if people have a little backside laxity, what we call a rectocele, but it doesn't mm -hmm. bother them, they're pooping good, they're not splinting, I will not fix it, especially if they're sexually active, because I don't want mm -hmm. more scar than necessary. I don't want mm -hmm. more risk of pain with sex than necessary. If you have a little laxity, but it doesn't bother you, I don't tend to fix it. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Less incisions, the better, because... totally. It can, you can always do physical therapy, you know, and help with that. But if you're not, like I said, with the uterus, if it ain't bothering you, I'm not bothering it. So let's just leave it alone. <laughs> I really like that. Yeah. I mean, the other thing, you know, it, and I think, you know, the, what we are both saying is like, go to a surgeon who's not in a hurry to do surgery. Like how many people come to me because people got their pap smear and they were told they had a cystocele? Yes. Right? Or the, the new popular thing is they got a defecogram because of bowel dysfunction and, the, and it, an imaging report says you have a cystocele, but mm -hmm. nothing bothers you. I make you stand up and squat and nothing comes out. That mm -hmm. is not a if surgeons are like, I can fix the bulge that's there, but I can't mm -hmm. fix something that somebody said you had that doesn't bother you or that an x-ray said you had, because exactly. that's not the same as like a bothersome problem. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think I've had such great success in my career because I don't bother things that are bothering people. <laughs> I only fix what the problem is, you know, and I yeah. give, you know, it's about the counseling, the appropriate expectations. 
customizing the surgical approach to each individual woman, you know, and only fixing things that are actually causing a problem. I love that. Yeah, I just I saw somebody recently who was coming in for pain, right? And, and got a Deficogram that said rectocele cystocele i think it said all the things and mm. on physical exam she wasn't bothered by a bulge she had no bulge splinting voiding dysfunction and it was not bulging on exam and she really wanted was hoping surgery was going to be the fix to the pain and it's like for those people i'm like i want you to see a surgeon who's going to say no mm -hmm. you know no prolapse repair is not going to let's address your pain get you into physical therapy see what's going on but fixing something that's not clinically there likely is only going to make it worse Oops. or mm -hmm. or the same and you, now you've yeah. gone through a surgery so really yeah. finding a surgeon who says no to a, a lot of surgeries is a good thing yeah and i will tell women too if i say no and they're super disappointed i'm like honestly if you go see another doctor you might find someone who's willing to do this because there are those types of physicians out there but i hope that you trust me enough to realize like if it was I, i'm a surgeon i like to operate if there was something worth fixing, I'd fix it. But I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to make it worse. Yeah, I love that. Well, thank mm -hmm. you so much for giving us a comprehensive prolapse discussion. It needed to happen. Prolapse is way more common than it gets talked about. And, uh, you know, we're, we all have the babies with the big heads. <laughs> um, let <laughs> people know. Where they, <laughs> I know, Vaginal. I love that. I am stealing that. Let people know where they can find you. And I'll put it in the show notes, of course. Awesome. I am located in Deer Park, Illinois, suburbs of Chicago. My practice is called Allure Pelvic Wellness. Yeah, and I'm on social media and I have a website, www. So you can find me everywhere. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. This was fun. It was fun. <laughs>